In 2005, I was ordained as a priest, but because of my inability to perform public speaking duties, anxiety, no homilies for me, I had to find a different career path in the church. Most probably don't even know this. Most Catholics I talk to don't even know this, but the Catholic Church has a ministry of exorcism which investigates supernatural occurrences, miracles, stigmata, and of course, demon possession. Demon possession isn't very common. In fact, it only occurs in less than 1% of the population. I should have chosen my words more carefully. The church has no official statistics on the number of individuals who are possessed, but the percentage of actual possessions the Ministry of Exorcism deals with versus those who are simply mentally ill, have a seizure disorder, or suffer from religious paranoia is far less than 1% of our clients. Again, I apologize. I was conflating numbers from a small pool to the entire population. For all I know, the percentage of possessed individuals is higher than I think, but most of those cases never even get reported. But based on purely anecdotal evidence, I doubt it. I would assume the percentage is still very low. I also doubt there are many unreported cases. Usually, if there is demonic activity taking place, the church finds out about it one way or another. People laugh at Catholics until their child starts levitating and spitting up pea soup. What many misguided religious leaders or followers deem demonic possession is actually just mental illness, commonly schizophrenia, or a seizure disorder such as Tourette's. Some religious folks watch too many movies like The Exorcist and assume a demon is hiding behind every bush or in every broom closet just waiting to sink spiny claws into their souls. We are constantly fighting a battle with the devil, but more often than not, that battle comes in the form of temptation, not full-blown demonic possession. Possessed individuals have usually opened their heart to a fallen angel in some way, often through occult practices, such as witchcraft, satanic rituals, worshiping idols or other gods, playing with a Ouija board, talking to the dead, Practicing astrology, using tarot cards, seeing a psychic, etc. To become possessed, an individual pretty much has to choose to have a relationship with a demon. And like most abusive relationships, it's hard to leave once you're in too deep. At that point, an individual can only be saved through faith in God and the assistance of an ordained exorcist from the Roman Catholic Church. We have a special rite, dating back to 1614, for casting out demons, and we are the only church with this rite and this power. Usually, a bishop performs exorcisms, but they can't pass that rite down to a priest. I was chosen to be a part of a ministry of exorcism because of my strong belief in the reality of evil. The thesis of my dissertation in seminary. You'd be surprised how many priests blinded by the wisdom of the world, see evil as more of an abstract idea than a concrete reality. I, however, know the reality of evil because I struggled with it internally for years. When the events I'm about to relay occurred, I was under the tutelage of, we'll call him Father Frank, the head of the Ministry of Exorcism in Bismarck, North Dakota. He told me in his 40 years working for the ministry, that he'd only encountered two demons. The first inhabited the body of an old woman in a town, oddly enough, called Devil's Lake. The woman had drowned her husband and three cats in said lake. The second was a possessed teenager who had made threats to his girlfriend that she would die on her 16th birthday. Frank thought he was just another emotionally distraught high schooler, but a few days later, on the girlfriend's birthday, police found the girl in a pool of her own blood and scrawled on the tub wall in said blood was a message in Latin, Et adio, ex altaber, Parsons. In English, that translates to, He rises. 
That story still chills my marrow, but I digress. Remember, 40 years working for the Ministry of Exorcism and Frank, my mentor, had only witnessed two possessions. Most cases turn out to be paranoid religious folks or mental illnesses, two segments of society that often overlap. During my first investigation, or what you could refer to as the beginning of my exorcism residency program, I witnessed my first demon. Lucky me. It makes me wish I would have just gotten the nerve to deliver a homily in front of a crowded church. The Ministry of Exorcism worked out of the basement of a cathedral that I will not name. On my first day, we got a frantic call from a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, of all people. If you don't know, Adventists aren't too fond of Catholics, going as far as to accuse the church of being the Antichrist in the end days. This particular Adventist family believed that their home was possessed by an evil entity, and having tried everything else, they had reluctantly turned to the church. The house was located in Mandan, a small town just across the Missouri River from Bismarck. The house was very ordinary. It didn't look haunted or spooky or anything. Not like the house on 112 Ocean Avenue in Amityville, New York, anyway. I told Frank that exact sentiment when we pulled up. Doesn't look like a haunted house. They never do, he said. We sat down and interviewed the family separately. None of them wanted to talk in front of each other, so we had to split them up. I talked to the father, who told me this disturbing account. He'd been suffering from what he called bone-crunching depression and thoughts of suicide. Sometimes, he told me, he was tempted to throw himself over the banister and into the basement, and that one day, while he was home alone, taking a nap, he woke up to see his clothes hangers floating in the closet. He slowly approached the closet door and slammed it shut sat down on the bed, shaking like a leaf. He thought maybe he was dreaming, but it felt too real. He said a quick prayer, got some socks from his dresser drawer, and sat down in the living room, where there was more light. He just wanted to get out of there, out of that house. He suddenly felt suffocated by some sort of force. He said he could feel it, pushing down on his chest. He had trouble breathing, felt himself getting dizzy. The last thing he remembered, while conscious, was falling off the couch, then black. While he was asleep, he had dreams about killing his family, smashing their faces in with a baseball bat. And while he was doing it, he was wearing a shabby bunny suit, cone-shaped head, droopy eye holes, gaping mouth with buck teeth. He described the murder in graphic detail, pieces of skull and brain splattering the walls and blood gushing onto the rabbit's white furry chest. He also had a dream about having sex with Eve in the garden. His penis was a serpent. He said he had trouble waking up, kept experiencing sleep paralysis, and felt the presence in the room. A voice coming from the basement, whispering, God's a faggot. Kill yourself. Kill your family. I tried talking to the wife, but she refused to say anything. Too scared. Father Frank talked to the kids, a son and a daughter, about what they had experienced. They were both really shy, but finally opened up after Frank offered them some root beer barrels. The boy told Frank about a nutcracker he had on his dresser. He woke up one night, and it turned to look at him, clacking its mouth up and down. He wanted to scream and run away, but an invisible hand shoved him into the mattress, and he couldn't move. He said he felt a demon's claws pressing into his chest, forcing him to watch the nutcracker go clack, clack, clack. When the nutcracker finished its speech, it simply turned to face the wall. The demon lifted from the boy's body and he ran into the living room where his parents were still up, sitting on the couch. Except the lights were off, the living room was dark, and when the boy spoke to them, they did not respond. He said his father and mother's skin was blue their eyes vacant and white, and when their mouths opened, roaches spilled out. The last thing he remembered was horrible unhuman noises coming from the basement, and that's when he slowly walked backwards, down the hall, to his bedroom, in a trance, like a zombie. 
He felt like he was floating, he said. Frank asked him where he had gotten the nutcracker. A garage sale? Antique store? The boy said he didn't remember. Sometimes, witches or occult worshippers will place curses on objects. That's what Frank was getting at. The girl told Frank that a little boy named Cody often talked to her, that she saw his face in mirrors and in the walls. The patterns on the wood paneling in the basement was the most common place he appeared. She said a bad man hurt Cody, buried him in the ground. She said that the bad man wore a bunny costume and that she'd seen him in the basement, blood smeared on his paws and whiskers and holding a baseball bat. The bunny asked her if she wanted to touch his boing boing and she ran away screaming. After the bunny scare, Cody's face appeared in her bedroom wall and he told her to stay away from the bunny, that he was a bad man, that he wanted something. What does the bunny man want? Frank asked. Everything, the girl said. Cody says it needs sacrifices though, more blood, before it can rise. Rise? From the dark place. Do you think Cody and the Bunny Man are ghosts? Frank asked. We don't believe in ghosts, the girl said matter-of-factly. Demons pretend to be ghosts, to try and trick people. After these interviews, I figured we'd just bless the place with holy water and oil, pray with a family, perform the rite, a dash of gospel readings, a call upon the saints, a pinch of Latin prayers. So it surprised me when Frank said, I want to set up a video surveillance so I can see exactly what's going bump in the night. I want to know what I'm dealing with. The family agreed, desperate to try anything at this point, and also scared. And the next thing I knew, Frank and I were setting up cameras in the kitchen, bedrooms, living room. But oddly enough, not the basement. Later, unfortunately, I'd find out why. We didn't set up camera in the basement, because that's where Father Frank and I were going to watch the family. I asked Frank if video surveillance was common, and he said no, but that he did it all the time. It helps weed out the crazies. Frank didn't seem to believe the stories. He figured the family was a bunch of religious nut jobs and they saw a demon in every nook and cranny. Though I don't know if this was a thinly veiled prejudice, because the family was Adventist, but I didn't ask, obviously. So, that night we sat in the basement, of all places, where the girl had seen the evil bunny covered in blood, and Cody's face, and the patterns of the wood paneling, and watched the family on three computer monitors. Frank told me he had bought the surveillance equipment on the church's dime, and to keep it quiet. He didn't want it getting back to the bishop. I felt Frank was sinning, lying and stealing like that, and I had planned to report him after this was all over. But those thoughts were miles away after what happened that night. I felt weird, creepy, spying on this family, and also terrified sitting in the darkness of their basement, a place I had not heard any good stories about. Frank insisted all the lights be off, to mess with my psyche, test my faith, and I couldn't help but peek over my shoulder every few minutes, expecting to see that evil bunny wielding a bat covered in gore. Quit it. Frank told me. You're making me nervous. This is all bullshit. You'll see. I jumped a little at his use of foul language. Father Frank was obviously a priest who'd seen too much and didn't care anymore. He made me feel kind of awkward, but not any more awkward than I felt watching the family in their living room, saying their nightly devotions. The father was reading the passage from Mark where Jesus cast a demon out of a possessed man. Legion! For we are many, the demons cried, before Jesus cast them into a herd of swine. About two thousand in number, who met their demise, when they rushed into a lake and were drowned. I think this passage was supposed to comfort his family. But they were part of the wrong religion, for any sort of protection from a force that's malevolent. I guess at the very least, they had turned to the church in their time of need, but part of me doubted we could do anything either. That's when I realized, I felt it too, a presence, something heavy pressing on me. It was whispering lies to me, causing me to doubt. I felt inferior in its presence. 
Have the demons... Have they ever made you doubt God? I nervously asked Frank. Have they ever made you lose faith? They'll try. They're just looking for a weak spot in your psyche. I hope you have faith to move mountains, because if you don't, they'll rip you to shreds. I swallowed. I had faith, but I feared that maybe I didn't have enough to stand against Satan and his legion. To be honest, I was scared out of my mind. Sweat dripping down my sides and shaking. I felt sick to my stomach, like there was a large stone there. Calm down, Frank said. They feed off fear. That just made me more scared. I had the sudden urge to glance over my shoulder again, but I kept my eyes trained forward on the monitors. We watched the parents go into bed, the kids. All was silent. No movement. Nothing. Frank drank black coffee and ate a donut and offered me one. I refused. Then I saw something moving beneath the kids' sheets. At first, I didn't believe my eyes. I figured it was one of the kids squirming. But the boy and girl were absolutely still in their queen bed. It moved again, snaking under the sheets toward their feet. I was about to say something to Frank who casually ate his donut as he watched. But the words caught in my throat when I glanced back at the monitor, and the sheet billowed up like a hot air balloon and floated around the room. I swallowed hard, staring intently at that floating sheet. Just upstairs, I kept reminding myself. This is happening. Just upstairs. And then, I saw something worse. A face in the fabric. It looked like a young boy with a white sheet over his head, pretending to be a ghost for Halloween, except that boy was floating around the room. The sheet drifted to the girl's side of the bed, and I saw the boy's mouth moving beneath. Frank turned up the volume, mostly static, but within the static, whispering, Come play with me. I'm buried out back. Dig me up and play with me. The girl sat up, Eyes glowing. Frank told me it was just a night vision on the camera. I didn't believe him. The girl started chanting in Latin. Et adio, ex alvator. Parsons, et adio, ex alvator. Parsons, et adio, ex alvator. Parsons. He is rising. He is rising. He is rising. Then, she got up and started beating her head against the wall. I immediately stood up. We gotta stop this. Sit your ass down, Frank said. But we're just observing. We can't interrupt. We need to know what we're dealing with. And I sat back down, terrified, shaking. This was too much. They're gonna hurt them, I said. And I hated it, but I could hear tears in my voice. Frank looked at me like I was weak and pathetic, and said, They won't kill them. The girl climbed back in bed, blood dribbling down her face, and went to sleep like nothing had happened. The form beneath the sheet dissipated, and the sheet collapsed over the son and daughter's bodies. We watched the monitor for hours. I intently, barely blinking, Frank sipping coffee and scratching his mustache, yawning occasionally. Nothing happened. Then, voices. What is that? Voices, like he was talking to an idiot. He cranked up the volume, adjusted the static. Two voices, actually. Sounded like men. They were discussing killing the boy. Cutting off his head. Eating his penis. I started praying. Felt like puking. You okay? Frank asked, though he didn't seem very interested. I can't just sit here and watch this. We can't do anything. We need to observe. That's when all hell broke loose. The nutcracker on the dresser began to float around the room, clacking its mouth up and down, speaking in some hollow wooden language. The bedroom door creaked open, and the shadow of a bunny fell long across the wall. The shrieking and crying of children nearly blew out Frank's speakers. 
Not the two kids in the room, but the disembodied voices of children, maybe hundreds of them. The bedroom door slammed closed with a bang. The bunny shadow disappeared. The nutcracker fell out of the air and cracked the sun on the head. And both the son and daughter woke up screaming and crying. I couldn't take it anymore. I got up and... The bunny was standing right behind me. A bad Easter get up. Cone head. Droopy eye holes. Gaping mouth with buck teeth. The furry chest was drenched in blood. And the end of the bat covered in gore. Wanna touch my boing boing faggot? I wept. Dropping to my knees, covering my eyes. I tried to recite a passage from the Gospels, but my throat swelled up. Two hands gripped my neck and squeezed, as the most terrifying, horrible noises I have ever heard swelled in my ears. An orchestra of demonic tongues, speaking in a language not meant for the human ear. Finally, fighting for breath and for life, my heart hammering, I cried, I cast you out, unclean spirit, along with every satanic power of the enemy, every specter from hell, and all your fellow companions, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The invisible hands released my throat, and the orchestra of demon tongues ceased. The evil bunny was gone. I turned to Frank, who just sat by the monitors glaring at me. Frank? Frank? Frank opened his mouth and roaches spilled out, but somehow, I could hear him speak through the avalanche of insects pouring out of his maw. I always knew you were a fucking faggot, a fucking Nancy boy. Thou shalt not lie with mankind, as with womankind. It is abomination. Leviticus, 1822 Do you not read your Bible, you fucking queer? You fucking fairy? God made your ass for pooping, your mouth for talking, not sucking you little cunt bitch. He was saying the most awful vile things to me and I couldn't take it anymore. So I ran up the stairs to check on the kids and that's when I saw it. A noose hanging from the banister, dangling in the stairwell. I pushed it past, up the stairs and toward the hallway that led to the children's bedroom. In the hall, I saw a little boy wearing a baseball cap and catcher's mitt. Embroidered on the cap was the name Cody. I blinked, and he was gone. But a baseball rolled across the carpet and stopped at my feet, speckled in blood. I kicked it away and ran down the hall and struggled to open up the door to the son and daughter's room. But some force was holding it shut. I prayed and kicked at the door and it flung open, and I found the boy and girl, huddled together in the sheets, sobbing. I held them and told them it was going to be okay. Soon, the parents and Frank joined me. What happened? The father demanded. Didn't you hear your daughter banging her head against the wall? Frank said. I glared at Frank, even though knowing what I had witnessed earlier was a hallucination, a demon praying out my insecurities, and not actually Frank himself. I told the family we needed to get out of the house immediately, but the father refused. I told him it wasn't safe here until we performed an exorcism. And this man, this self-righteous preacher man, who invited us into his home to ward away the evil spirits, actually had the gall to tell me, No, we're going to stay up all night and pray. We're going to do this ourselves. I said, I know you're a religious man. So am I. But your house is full of evil. You can't do this by yourself. You need the authority of Christ and his church. I want to do this, the father insisted. I need to do this. If I can't protect my family, nobody can. He was full of pride, and I didn't know if it was the demons or if he was just naturally this way. I think you need to see the tapes, I told him. No, I don't want to see the tapes. A demon attacked your child. Get out of my house, you pagans. You're the Antichrist. You brought these demons into my home. I was about to argue with him, but Frank said, 
Let's get the fuck out of here. I would have been more shocked by his F-bomb if I hadn't just witnessed demons attacking children and heard the spew of toxic waste the roach hallucination of Frank had spewed at me earlier. On our way out, I grabbed the Nutcracker doll. I don't know why. I wanted to keep a piece of this place to study or something. Or I wanted to protect the boy from it. As if this doll contained the evil and not the house itself. Frank packed up the surveillance equipment and we left. I noticed the noose was gone from the stairwell on our way out. Frank and I went to a greasy spoon and had an early 4 a.m. breakfast. Those fools don't know what they're doing, he said. He ordered bacon and eggs, even though it was a Friday and it was Lent, but I didn't say anything. By now, I had gotten a clear picture that Frank was not a very good priest and was definitely not fit for his job, but neither was I. I loved God, but I was filled with doubt, insecurity, and sin, and I wasn't so sure it was just the demons from the house having a negative influence on me. He thinks he can just pray the demons out, I said, disgusted. He's not an exorcist. He's not trained for demonic combat or spiritual warfare. Frank laughed at me, but I didn't ask him why, though it upset me. That house needs to be burned to the ground if you ask me, Frank said. Really? I've never seen a house so possessed with evil. He shoved a piece of bacon in his mouth, and I winced. He seemed to derive pleasure from that. You know, that's the same house where I found the girl in the tub. But I didn't tell you the whole story. What actually happened is that on her 16th birthday, she was found hanging upside down from the shower rod eviscerated, her guts in a neat pile in the sink, and her pet dog lamb, drowned in its owner's blood. They found her boyfriend in the kitchen, carving the mask of the beast into his forehead with a kitchen knife. Crying, he rises, he rises. I pushed my pancakes away. I wasn't hungry anymore. You know what I think, Frank said. I think that's the devil's house. After we left the diner, I tossed a nutcracker into the dumpster out back, and we headed to the basement of the cathedral to review the tapes and write up a report. A few days later, the paperboy delivered the Bismarck Tribune to the rectory steps, and I picked it up, and when I saw the headline, I nearly puked. Mandon, murder-suicide. The father had beaten his wife to death with a baseball bat, then hung himself from the banister. He was found wearing a bunny suit. Written on the wall in blood was Et Adio Exaldeber Parsons. Blood spatter of the children was found all over the bedroom, but the bodies were missing. I called the Mandan Police Department anonymously and told them to dig up the yard. Sure enough, the backyard was excavated, and they found a child graveyard. 64 bodies, 66 if you include the son and daughter, buried in the family garden, beneath some rhubarb and yellow summer squash. The boy was found with a nutcracker jammed down his tiny throat, the gaping mouth of the doll within the boy's own gaping mouth. I don't think I can do this job any longer. Frank tells me I'll get used to it, but I don't know. Frank tells me I'll never see another demon again. Most likely. But I can't shake it off. I feel depressed and alienated. I find myself doubting and loving God who can let this sort of evil exist in his world. I know I'm supposed to have faith and not question his ways. But something inside me feels broken. I feel myself growing bitter and angry at God. Maybe I'm possessed. Maybe I need to have more faith. Maybe I need professional help. Maybe I need to stop thinking about men. Maybe I need to quit the ministry. And maybe I need to quit returning to the house in my dreams. Sometimes I sleepwalk and I find myself lying in the house's basement, chanting, Non est hic, Xerxit, non est hic, Xerxit, non 
Est hic, Xerxic. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. What have I done?